Hi Grace Vineyard, Andy again. I've purposely chosen a bit of a gloomy title because we're living in rather gloomy times with this uncertainty. There's so much pain around. Most of us are feeling it to some extent. The COVID-19 pandemic seems to be going on forever without any real hope of better times yet. Hang in there with me. This is a serious talk, but it's not a gloomy talk. I'm talking today about surrender, not giving up, but giving in, giving in to the will of God for your life. I've started most of my recent talks by likening the pandemic to a storm, the storms raging worse than ever. We've got less energy and hope than we had when it first started because we've been battling on for so long. We can be weary and dispirited because there seems to be no end. There's a temptation to think that God has abandoned us, to want to give up. Life is just too hard. Don't give up. God hasn't abandoned us. We all face mental health issues as we try and persevere. The world of instant answers and solutions has long gone. And we're all grieving for a former way of life. We've lost things for now that we love to do. And we've got no idea when the world can get back to some sort of normality. It's all frustrating and confusing. We were more compliant at the beginning, but now we're just fed up with it all. I've been very open and honest about my own battle with depression. Pain, whether it's physical or mental, gives you an inclination to want to just withdraw, to suffer alone. Please don't. As we grow weary, we have less energy to think about other people's problems. There's a tendency to think, I've not got the energy to face my own problems, so you lot are going to have to face your own battles. I'm just being honest. I'm sure many of you have had thoughts like this. If not, then you're a better person than me. But please, let somebody among the Grace Vineyard community know how you're feeling. Please don't wait for them to be told by God that you're hurting. We should know about your pain, but this pandemic isolates and separates us. And it confuses us. I've got little idea of what's troubling most of you as I try and find God's strength for my own battles. Please cry out to each other and don't suffer alone. God has made us for community because God is community. There is a world of suffering out there. We're all suffering as the storm continues, but please remember that God wants us to help each other and he wants us to ask for help when we need it. So please reach out for help and also look out for those who you can help. God is love. God is community. And all this Zoom stuff, I don't particularly like it. I'm naturally a quiet guy who just likes to listen, but often when I want to talk on Zoom, I can't get a word in because the noisy ones are hogging it. But I do firmly believe that it's the best that we can do in the circumstances to create community. I come each week to hear from God, to be fed, but I also come to give. How can I help and support others? I join the breakout rooms because it gives us quieter ones a chance to talk. Please pluck up the courage to talk and encourage each other and ask. Worshipping with YouTube as well is a very different type of worship. But worship is about God, not my personal preferences, not my song choices, not the way I like to do it. It's about God. I persevere with worship and with Zoom because it's good for me to remember how great God is. Please try and make the most of what we have and not mope about what we don't, what we've lost. Come to Grace on Zoom to give as well as to hear. God is love, God's community. Mark, last week, carried on the story from the book of Acts with Paul's third missionary journey. I'm following on as Paul spreads the good news of Jesus wherever he went. It may have been good news to those who listened to him, but to others, they took offence at what Paul was saying 
and they made life very difficult for him. He was beaten, jailed and flogged for his efforts. The Jewish leaders hated what he was doing and they were out to stop him as soon as they could. You may remember me talking last year about Peter and John in front of the Jewish leadership group called the Sanhedrin. I said then that Peter and John didn't let fear stop them from what they thought God wanted them to do. I also pointed out that their prayer wasn't one of safety and protection like ours usually are. Rather, it was a prayer praising God and then asking him for boldness to carry on spreading the message of God's love. Paul was like that too, boldly telling the people Jesus' message to whatever his personal cost. So I'll be talking about Paul's final weeks of freedom before he was imprisoned. I'll pick up part of the way through chapter 20 and then on into the middle of 21. Here's the story read from the New Living Translation. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, for he didn't want to spend any more time in the province of Asia. He was hurrying to get to Jerusalem, if possible, in time for the festival of Pentecost. But when we landed in Miletus, he sent a message to the elders of the church at Ephesus, asking them to come and meet him. When they arrived, he declared, You know that from the day that I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I've done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I've endured the trials that come to me from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I've had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God, and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I'm bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me that in city after city, that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And now I know that none of you to whom I've preached the kingdom will ever see me again. I declare today that I've been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. For I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. So guard yourself and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has anointed you as leaders. I know that false teachers, like vicious wolves, will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some of you, your own group, will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. Remember the three years that I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day, and my many tears for you. And now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that's able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those that he has set apart for himself. I've never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. And I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. While he was finishing speaking, he knelt and he prayed with them. They all cried as they embraced and kissed him goodbye. They were sad most of all because he had said that they would never see him again. Then they escorted him down to the ship. After saying farewell to the Ephesian elders, we sailed straight to the island of Cos. The next day we reached Rhodes and then we went to Patara. There we boarded a ship sailing for Phoenicia. We sighted the island of Cyprus, passing it to our left and landed at the harbour of Tyre in Syria, where the ship was to unload its cargo. We went ashore and found the local believers and stayed with them a week. 
These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. And when he returned to the ship at the end of the week, the entire congregation, including the women and children, left the city and came down to the shore with us. There we knelt, prayed and said our farewells. Then we went aboard and they returned home. The next stop after leaving Tyre was Poltimus, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed for one day. The next day we went to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. He had four unmarried daughters who'd got the gift of prophecy. Several days later, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over, took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands with it. And then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But he said, why all this weeping? You're breaking my heart. I'm ready not only to be jailed in Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of our Lord Jesus. And when it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up and we said, the Lord's will be done. So, Paul tried to follow the example of his Saviour Jesus in following the leading of the Father through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. As we read through Acts, it's obvious that Paul would follow his convictions about what he believed God wanted him to do. He didn't do things unless he believed that God had told him to do it. He was aiming to go to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost and nothing or no one would stop him. You may remember in an earlier bit of the story there was a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas about John Mark. Paul would not budge in his opinion that they shouldn't take this unreliable mark with them. So Paul and Barnabas went their separate ways and God blessed both of them with their new partners. Later on in Acts we find Paul praising Mark. So we did have second thoughts about the guy. Paul was human too. He didn't always get it right. Anyway, we know that Paul is stubborn and determined to go to Jerusalem he tries to listen for God's direction. He said, Now I'm bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. So God had clearly warned Paul about trouble and pain that was lying ahead, but he didn't seem to care. He said that he'd always been bold enough to tell everyone the good news, that they needed to turn from their sinful, selfish ways and then accept the grace of God, asking God to be their guide through the Holy Spirit, helping them to make the most of this life on earth. Paul said that he'd never shrunk back from telling others anyone, that his conscience was clear and that he'd always told the truth to those who would listen, as well as to those who wouldn't. That was their choice. I can't boast that. I've been very open about my natural lack of self-confidence. Naturally, I will keep quiet and try to avoid offence or trouble. I'm a peace lover and I'm not adventurous. I think things through too much. I keep quiet and I stay inactive. If you think about the story of Jesus walking on the water, I'd be a disciple in the boat, scared about this ghost who's just appeared, walking on stormy sea, as if the deadly waves weren't bad enough, now there's a ghost. I'd be there thinking, what does that madman Peter think that he's doing, asking a ghost if he can go and walk on water? What's wrong with him? Can't he see those waves? How can he be so stupid? You see, I get caught up in the detail and I freeze. 
But without beating myself up too much, I do go on adventures for and with God. He does help me to do things that I couldn't do naturally, like public, like public speaking and being a leader, battling through recording. I don't like it, but I do it. Things that I wouldn't choose to do, but things that God asks me to do anyway. The more I let him, I see that God helps me and the easier it gets. The trick is, don't look at the waves, just look at Jesus, who might appear to be a ghost, but he's not. Trust him. Now back to the passage. Paul was sure that God wanted him to go to Jerusalem and God had warned him that this would bring trouble of some kind. He prepared himself for it and he warned the believers that he didn't expect to see them again. Did you notice that when, when they got to Tyre, it says that these believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go to Jerusalem? Prophecy is something that we should be very careful about, especially if you're a naturally confident person. These believers prophesied to Paul that he shouldn't go to Jerusalem, whereas Paul was feeling very strongly that God wanted him to do that. So who was right? If we do hear prophecy, we're told to weigh it up. Ultimately, it's between you and God. Prophecy should be backed up by our own conviction of what's being said to us by God, what God wants for us. Sadly, prophecy can be used wrongly. I heard of one guy who stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord, when Moses built the ark, blah, 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 and then he sat down, and his wife poked him and she said, Noah built the ark. And so he immediately got up again, and he said, thus saith the Lord, it wasn't Moses, it was Noah. Please don't use prophecy flippantly. And please use understandable language. Speaking in old Elizabeth, Elizabethan language doesn't make it more authoritarian. Even worse, prophecy can be used for what we want, using it manipulatively. Prophecy must always be encouraging and it was all, must always be in line with what the Bible says. I know of people who've been badly damaged by prophecy concerning the death of a loved one or whether to marry someone. Generally, I believe that we probably shouldn't use prophecy concerning birth, marriage and death because of the huge impact it can have. We pray earnestly for these things, but we must ask for God's will to be done and for God's help. In Caesarea, Paul was also given a visual prophecy from a guy called Agabus. He tied himself in Paul's belt. He didn't tell Paul what to do, just warned him of imprisonment if he went to Jerusalem. It didn't seem to surprise or disturb Paul, but the other believers heard it and tried to persuade Paul not to go to Jerusalem, but he wouldn't listen. So they declared, the Lord's will be done. Does that remind you of anyone? Jesus, of course. Jesus said, the Lord's will be done. Prophecy is a big topic. We can't really tackle it this morning while we look at surrendering to God. But I firmly believe in prophecy. I've had it given to me. I've used it. Although I wouldn't call myself a prophet with a ministry in it. I do hear from God. And I discussed that in a talk last year called Listening to God and Others. As I said, prophecy is ultimately between you and God. Please use it, please listen to it, but you must weigh it up for yourself so that you hear from God yourself. Paul felt very strongly that God wanted him to go to Jerusalem. When Mike and Joe told me early last year that they were going up north, I'm afraid that my immediate reaction was tears. Them going is very painful for me. It came at a time when I wasn't in a very strong state of mind because I was still embattled with the pressures of life. I didn't try and stop them, but they could see how much it hurt me. And it hurt them too. 
Mark and Jill, bless them, stepped in and, and advised me, hold on to everything with open hands. I'll say it again, hold on to everything with open hands. Life is fragile, nothing's permanent. If things are snatched out of your hands, while you're grasping them, then it will hurt a whole lot more to get them torn out of your hands. Mark and Jill, as well as Mike and Joe, are people who have stepped out in faith, doing what they believe God wants them to do. It may not make any logical sense, but doing God's work can sometimes not make any logical sense. They are willing to risk the course of their lives to do what God has told them to do, and God bless them for it. Paul believed very firmly that he should go to Jerusalem, whatever the cost, and he wasn't put off by other Christians warning him or begging him not to go. As this is history, we know the end of the story. But for them, when the story was happening, it was an uncertain future for them. Paul was imprisoned, and eventually he would be executed for being a Christian. So should he have gone to Jerusalem? Who knows? But whatever happens, God can use our circumstances for good. Whatever choices we make, it may not benefit us. Sometimes it just works out for the benefit of others. Because Paul was imprisoned, he got to tell all sorts of other people the gospel message. It says in Philippians 1, starting at 12. And I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that's happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of the Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Another, another benefit, especially to us, of Paul's imprisonment, was that he wrote letters to the churches that he couldn't visit anymore. Those letters fill up our New Testament, and because of them, we know what the early church was teaching. We've got extremely early copies of those letters, which give us confidence that what we spread is the same message that the early church taught. God can bring good out of any sort of crap in our lives. Please listen to my last message about hope. Don't despair, but do give in to the will of God for your life. Paul was willing to do anything that he believed God wanted him to do, whatever the cost. And so was Jesus. And Jesus told us this. He said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. At the beginning of last year, I believe God told me to wear and make this little cross. I wore it at first so that others could see what prompted me to do acts of kindness, that I'm a Christian. But now I'm stuck inside shielding and hardly anyone sees me. But I put it on daily as a reminder to myself about my daily choice to follow God's leading, however inconvenient that is. This is Romans 12 verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way of worship, to worship him. Living sacrifices can always jump off the altar. It's your daily choice whether you give in to the will of God for your life or not. 1 Peter 1.13 says this, it's for the message version. So roll up your sleeves, put your mind in gear, be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. Don't lazily slip back into those old grooves of evil, doing just what you feel like doing. You didn't know any better then, but you do now. As obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life shaped by God's life, a life energetic and blazing with holiness. God said, I'm holy, so you be holy. So, Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Give up your selfish desire. 
but be motivated by love, your love relationship with God. May it be passion rather than duty, because unless, it, unless it's done in love, then you're wasting your time and your effort. We're saved by grace, God's love, not by works, the things that we do. Doing stuff for God doesn't make him love you any more than he already does. And doing things for God doesn't mean that he's contracted to give you what you want. He's God Almighty, not your genie or your employer. But we are meant to do stuff for God because he loves us and because we love him. So, give up. Give up to God's will in your life. Trust him. He won't let you down. He adores you and he has your best interests in mind. I want to end with the covenant prayer that was made by John Wesley in the mid-1700s. I've translated it a bit into 21st century English. I challenge you to make this your prayer too. I'm no longer my own, but yours, Lord. Put me to what you choose. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you and laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. Freely and heartily, I yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I've made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Thank you.